Okay. So hi everyone. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, today uh, Ming Wang Zhu. So Ming Wang is uh, an associate professor at the University of Austin, uh, at the University of Texas, sorry, uh, at Austin. So he received his PhD in 2013 under the supervision of uh, Laurence Karine. So he works uh, lie at the intersection of machine learning and Bayesian statistics. So he worked on a lot of stuff. So, such as probabilistic methods, approximate inference, generative models, uh, deep nets, uh, Bayesian non parametrics, too. Uh, and today we will present uh, some recent work on deep generative models. So, Mingwang, the uh, stage is yours. Okay, okay. Th thank you, Max Mi. And uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here. And it's my great pleasure to present at this seminar. Um, so, uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me or, or send this stuff in the chat. I, I have another screen open that so I'm monitoring what's going on in the chat as well. So uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, so this is a, a talk about uh, uh, deep journey model. It's a, it's a basically, uh, comp it's a, we're talking about both diffusion model, but also we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, generative adversarial net. So we're going to show actually uh, these two things can actually work together with each other pretty well in, in two different perspectives. We're going to present two different perspectives. We're not sure which one is going to win in the future, or maybe each of them have its own advantages. And we'll see as the things, as we start, we, we keep continuing on these research directions. Um, so before I go to all the uh, technical detail, uh, let me first uh, uh, introduce my collaborator. So Huang Jie and Zheng Dong are PhD students at UT Austin, and the Peng Chen and Wei Zhu, they are, uh, they are uh, from Microsoft in Seattle. Okay. So, so deep generative model, this is a field that has been, had a significant progress in the past decade, right? So if you view the history, I would say uh, both variation autoencoder and the generative adversarial net uh, two representative examples of a different general model, they came, about, came around, uh, they, they published around 2013. Uh, and since then, there's significant interest in these whole areas. Uh, it's really because that uh, many methods that we have been doing before, like uh, fact model, mixture model, they work pretty well for low dimensional data, but for high, very high dimensional data, such as natural images, for example, 1,000 by 1,000 image, you have, 10, you have 1 million pixels. This is really high dimensional data and the traditional method uh, typically struggle. And these two methods stand out in terms of modeling this type of high dimensional data. And in addition to variation autoencoder and, and again, um, autoregressive model, it's also been very popular, especially recent one like a VQAE where they combine the idea of vector quantization in the latent space and the, uh, and the sequence modeling using transformer, they have been also getting really, really good uh, performance. And uh, in addition to these three model and another one that's pretty recent, um, it, it's actually not a proposed very recent, but it's been shown to be able to work on high dimensional data um, providing competitive performance in comparison to again, uh, within the just last couple of years. And uh, this is called the denoising diffusion probabilistic model. Uh, this is also known as a score-based general model. Okay, I, I will introduce more about, the, about this particular model later. And uh, what we did, uh, what, what I'm going to introduce in this talk uh, is two work we did in this area. One is called a truncated diffusion probabilistic model. Uh, the reason we did this work is because the, diff the diffusion model has been shown to work really well, but a fundamental problem with that is typically you need hundreds or even thousands of, of steps. And each step involving uh, goes through a network which has a similar size as a, 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 a network, a generator in generative adversarial net. So you need hundreds or even thousands of times more computation to generate a single image. So that's why I propose, propose this so-called truncated diffusion probabilistic model. And another perspective is we also think about why diffusion model works, right? So that's why I also propose the diffusion gap. 
and we, we are trying to visual diffusion as one type of data augmentation. And then, well, we can combine the data augmentation to better train a GAN model, okay. So uh, the, 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 the also significant interest in these areas because um, there are experiments showing that uh, you can provide in text information and uh, the generative model able to generate in photorealistic image matching what you're trying to describe in your text. So, so this is a, a, some results we had back in 2020. I think it was a state of that at that time. Um, so this is the paper we published in iClear 2020. And the, we, this is a particular type of GAN model. Um, uh, we model text with a topic model and uh, we model image with, with GAN and it is a combination model. And we show this type of model actually works pretty well uh, on lower diversity data set. For example, on, on, on the on the image exclusively birds, or on the image exclusively flower and the descriptions. This type of uh, model actually works pretty well. Um, but uh, it uh, gradually become, um, it, it is actually struggles when your data set has much higher diversity. For example, the COCO data set. And uh, for example, this is the state of that in 2020. If you're asking to describing a child with black clothes in standing on top of a snow covered hill. So the model is doing something related to this concept, but uh, the, the detail is definitely not, not far away from photorealistic. Right? People can easily tell this is not a, not a natural image. And uh, what happened after that is, uh, uh, diffusion model from OpenAI. They show using diffusion model by combining with the text guidance and also a particular type of guidance they call a classified free guidance. And they're able to achieve uh, astonishing results. And the first model they propose is a DALI and then that's based on uh, autoregressive model. But that model, the, data, the, the image generated is a little bit blurred. But uh, when they change to the diffusion model, the Glide and the later the DALI 2, they are able to uh, achieve amazing results. Right? That, and the image they're generating is high quality and it matches really well with, with the text, text description. And they're very recent. And uh, from Google, they have another uh, model called Imagine. This is also essentially is a text guided diffusion model. And uh, there's a couple of difference from, from DALI 2 in terms of how, how the text is encoded. Uh, but essentially, the, 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 one of the key component is the, is the diffusion model uh, with the text guidance. Okay. In addition to diffusion model, uh, there's also very recent work from Google as well. They call the PARTY. It's auto-regressive text to image model from Google. Uh, so, so this model, they show they can using uh, the backbone of a uh, vector quantization GAN, where in the latent space, you have a sequence model. So you, you, you're embedding your text into a latent sequence and you have a generator to generating this latent sequence to your image, okay? So in this talk, we're going to mainly focus on the diffusion model part. Um, so th that, that has already showing has great success in terms of uh, generating a photorealistic image either unconditional or either under guidance of, of, of text. But this type of model uh, has, has problems. First of all, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that they typically need hundreds or even thousands of steps to, to generating a single image. And each step is already as, as time consuming as, as it goes through a, a, a regular GAN generator. And also this type of model may not work that well for small data set, okay? So what are we trying to pro propose is one way is how can we significantly accelerate the diffusion model without hurting the performance? And that's why we propose so-called truncated diffusion model. Another perspective is uh, what if you only have a small data set? What can you do, right? So on the right, on the right side of the image is from uh, it is uh, trained on the Pokemon dataset. The Pokemon dataset only has about 800 images. 
how can you train a deep general model with only hundreds of images or even fewer, right? So this, this is very relevant for certain domain where you only have very few images. And also in, this, in that domain, you may don't have any domain specific knowledge to help you do data augmentation. Okay, so that's also an important problem. In many domain, you don't necessarily have the image as your data. You may have given some high dimensional vectors. You don't, have, you don't know how to util, utilize the domain knowledge to give you additional data. For image, I know I can rotate it. I can, I can, I can change the color. It still, still looks like a natural image. But for many other data, I may not necessarily has, has such type of uh, domain knowledge. For that type of scenario, how can we, how can we train deep general model? So these are also uh, challenging problems. So before I go to uh, discuss what we propose in this area, uh, uh, since this is, this is a, a very general audience, uh, let, let me, let me uh, first uh, go through uh, the GAN, the basics of GAN, and then talk about the basic diffusion model, and then go to talk about our work, okay? So first of all, the generative universal net, which is uh, um, proposed in 2013 and 2014, is not, not in that in 2013 published in 2014 is essentially proposing a two player mean max game right so you have a you have a discriminator uh, that's trying to uh, distinguish a true image you see and a fake image you generate and you have a generator trying to confuse the discriminator so this is a mean max game between two players and at that time, when this was proposed, it actually already does well on MNIST digit, which is grayscale 28 by 28. So it's only about 700, 784 dimension. So, so it's, a, it's relatively low dimension, a simple data set. It can already generate pretty well for this type of MNIST digit. However, it struggles on natural images, okay? But, uh, um, but uh, since uh, the, the progress in this area is really fast, right? So the, the, the problem with uh, this criticism for GAN is essentially um, that if you theoretically understanding GAN is you can think about the GAN is trying to um, minimize the jason shannon divergence. If your discriminate is optimized, then theoretically can show this mean max objective reduced to the Jason Shannon divergence between the data and the, uh, and the generated distribution. So this Jason Shannon divergence theoretically has the issue is that if your generated data and the true data, they have non-overlapping support, which is almost always the case for high dimensional data, then your Jason Shannon divergence is not well-defined. So it basically stays a constant in many of the, uh, it stays a constant and you don't have a valid gradient. And, uh, and that's why many, many methods have been proposed. Uh, the many heuristics uh, try to address this potential theoretical issue. And uh, we're going to talk more about that later, okay. So, so commonly empirically we also find out uh, the training is unstable. It's very common to have a mode collapse, which means uh, even if your data has many different modality, in the end of the day, you may only try to generate in one single modality. For example, if your image has, has, has people of different age, different gender, may, maybe in the end of the day, the model just tries to generate in, um, a, a particular age group and a particular gender, okay? So, so that's a mode collapse problem. And also typically, again, need a big training data to work well. So how to, how to improve again, right? So the many, many, uh, many thoughts has been um, devoted into this uh, improvement. One is uh, network architecture. And uh, this really matters. What type of architecture, even if you change nothing about the original training strategy, by changing the architecture, you can significantly improve the performance. Another is uh, better regularization. So we just mentioned GAN training is unstable and also uh, so how, how can we regularize it? And also it's easy to model collapse. How can we regularize it to prevent, to make it more stable, 
and make them more resistant to more resistance to mold collapse issues. And, and an, another perspective to improve again is from the objective function perspective. As I just mentioned before, the theoretically, if you have optimized the discriminator, you are optimized the Jason Shannon divergence, and this one has theoretical issues, which we're going to illustrate a little bit later. So from the architecture perspective, right? So um, one, one breakthrough is the deep convolutional GAN proposed in 2016 that essentially uh, introducing deconvolutional structure into the generator. And this can already significantly boost the performance of the vanilla GAN to model natural images. And also there are many other additional work like self-attention GAN and also uh, more recently style GAN, style GAN 2 and style GAN 3. So style GAN, uh, the, the style GAN is proposed in 2019, but also getting further improved in 2020 and 2021. So it can already generate really, really nice images, right? If you look at it, the image here from style GAN, to, style GAN uh, this is trained on the some bedroom images. This image already looks pretty good. So, but, but uh, uh, th this area is actually um, computational intensive. Finding a good network architecture is not easy. For example, it, it, the, it took a 92 GPU year and the 225 megawatt hour of electricity on an in-house cluster NVIDIA V100 for the style GAN 3 project. Okay, so, so to give idea, this project essentially uh, consumes the average household annual electricity times 20. So which means it, it costs a, a 20 years of electricity to support a single household in the US. Okay, so it's definitely not uh, it's definitely not, not energy efficient. So, but uh, th this is the cost these days to, to, do, to, to do with, the, to, to, to work in this area, to get in the state of art architecture, okay. So one thing is architectural design. Another thing is uh, how can we better regularize for the training of the GAN? So the many different strategies being proposed in, in, in the past, including gridding the penalty, and uh, injecting instance noise and uh, spectral normalization or consistency regularization. So there's many different techniques being proposed to try to make a gun works better and works more stable. And another perspective is the object function. So as I mentioned before, so the, the vanilla GAN corresponding to the Jason Shannon divergence when the discriminator is optimized. So, so that, that, that uh, uh, Jason Shannon divergence has a problem is if you don't have overlapping support, then your Jason Shannon divergence is a constant, right? So if you, if you become the same as each other, then it becomes zero. So it's, so it's, it's a, it's a object function that theoretically you won't have useful gradient to guide, guide the learning of the generator towards the true data distribution. So that's why uh, in 2017, the, the Western Stangan paper being proposed. So they proposed to replace the Jason Shannon divergence with the Wesserstein distance. And the Wesserstein distance has no such an issue that even if the uh, original data and the generated data have no overlapping support, the, the, the Wesserstein distance can still provide a useful gradient. But uh, there is also a caveat here is that um, the, the Wesserstein distance is typically also casted as a, as a mean max problem. So it has a critical function that it has to satisfy a certain constraint. And, uh, but this, con this, this Lipschitz constraint in reality is very difficult to, to ensure whether it's difficult to check whether it's uh, actually satisfied or not in practice. So, then people providing many different heuristic to approximately imposing this constraint. And, uh, and their later work trying to argue actually is not whether using Jason Shannon divergence or whether stand distance that matters. What really matters is the mean max, this kind of adversarial dynamic between the generator and the critic, that, that, that really matters, okay. 
So I'm not going to go to that detail, but uh, um, but the, but uh, anyway, so this kind of Wetterstein um, has valid gradient in the perspective actually motivate us to uh, proposing a, a, a different uh, uh, different uh, statistical distance to measure the distribution between to measure the difference between the generated data and the true data. And our basic idea is actually we're proposing a bi-directional transport. So in, in optimal transport or western distance, you're, ta you're talking about the transport between, you're talking about the optimal transport between the true data distribution and the generated dis data distribution. And this is not directional. Okay, go from the data to the, uh, to the uh, generated data or go from the generated data to the true data, there's no difference in, in, in object function. So we propose a bi-directional transport. The basic idea uh, is a, a joint distribution of your true data X and the generated data Y <clears throat> can be factorized using the chain rule. So this is not the chain rule for gradient back propagation. This is the chain rule to factorize the joint into the product of a marginal and a conditional. So if you factorize the joint into a product of marginal and a conditional, then you have two ways. You can use in the marginal X times the conditional Y given X, or using the marginal y times the condition x given y. And then you can use in Bayes' theorem to define what's your conditional distribution y given x. And uh, this providing a, a, a bi-directional transport. Okay, so this is not symmetric. Go from your data to your generated data and go from your, go from your generated data back to the true data. These are two separate laws. Okay, and we, I'm not going to go to the technical detail, uh, but we have a paper here in 2020, uh, in last year's new repos. So what we show is that um, if you only do the forward, which is from the data to uh, generated data transport, then you have a mode covering behavior. If you do the opposite, then you have a mode seeking behavior. So what do I mean mode cover and mode seeking? So, so look at uh, the first row here. This is a, the, the red curve, the, sorry, the, 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 the red curve is the true data distribution is a mixture of two Gaussian. If it's mode cover, you will have another distribution trying to uh, make sure uh, every, wherever this data, there will be a, a non-small density over there, okay? So if, for example, if you want to cover these two modes, you can actually use a single Gaussian, okay? If it's mode seeking, then you only, you, you only care as long as you can put your data in the, in the region, uh, in a high density region, you're fine, okay? But uh, to well representing this distribution, you need a compromise between these two behavior. You need a good compromise between mode cover and mode seeking. And we show we can combine these two type of transport forward from data to generated distribution or backward from generated distribution back to the data. And we can show we can achieve a good compromise between mode cover and mode seeking behavior. So th this is very unique, okay. And, uh, and uh, what's this also very interesting compared to existing work in GAN and the Western GAN is that in GAN and Western GAN, the dynamic between the discriminator and the generator is very important. So they have to constantly play with each other. So if you, let's say, let's freeze the discriminator and keep the generated training. What typically happens is they're going to degenerate. Okay, they're going to collapse for both scan and Western scan gap. But for our method, um, we don't have such kind of issue. Okay, so, so this is another interesting thing. So, so, the, the, so, so we don't, so, so this shows that, that there's some thing that's fundamentally different from uh, what's being really done in this, um, Again, the Western Stagan part by using our method. Okay. So anyway, so that's a, that's the history about uh, uh, about uh, generating reversal net and the many different ways to improve it from architecture perspective, from the object function perspective, and uh, from the regularization perspective. Okay. And the more recent progress um, in this area, including big again. Right, they, they're training big class conditional GAN on a diverse data set. So they can work on ImageNet, which has many different uh, category of data uh, of images. And also there's uh, another very, uh, another more recent work is in 2020, it's called a differentiable augmentation. 
So the so this allows to train GAN on smaller data set. Essentially, the essential idea is you're going to uh, send your augmented image and your augmented fake image to the discriminator. Okay, so so and by that way you can provide differentiable augmentation that allow you to work on even small data set. And then more recently, there's a project again, and they have a showing the this is combining pre-trained feature encoder and a multiple discriminator, and they can show they can further boost the performance of the of uh, push up the push the uh, state of that of the results of the GAN. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This is a, a paper uh, coming out from OpenAI. Uh, so we have just talked about all the same about again, but there's a paper coming out uh, not, not too long ago. They called the diffusion model bit again on image synthesis. I, I believe this came out in 2021. So this is actually a very eye-catching statement, right? Diffusion model bit again on image synthesis. And they showed the results here on ImageNet. The results looks pretty good. But, uh, but uh, do we agree with this statement? I, I would say this is only true to a certain extent, okay? Because diffusion models indeed have achieved really good results on conditional uh, or unconditional or conditional image generation. But, uh, but as pointed out in this 2020 paper, it takes about 20 hours to sample 50,000 image. So we're not even talking about the training time, we're just talking about inference time. You're talking about, to generating 50,000 image, you need 20 hours. And this is 32 by 32 image, size image. We're not talking about high resolution yet. Okay. But this only took, again, one minute to do in, in a regular GAN architecture, okay? So, so the, 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 the message is, uh, yes, diffusion model has been, has enjoying great success, but, uh, they also have a problem is they are really, really slow, okay? Uh, but let's look at why they are really slow, right? So the basic idea of the model is uh, that you're going to um, have a forward diffusion process that uh, gradually adding Gaussian noise to the data. Okay? You, you, you can think of it typically, you, you shrink your data a little bit and adding a little bit of Gaussian noise. You shrink your data a little bit, adding a little more Gaussian noise. So if you go to, if you do this many, many st steps, for example, thousand, thousand, a thousand a step, then you end up with a pure noise. And then you have a denoising step is to figure out how I'm going to remove the noise from the data a little bit, one, a little bit at each step, okay? So, so that's the basic idea of a diffusion probabilist model, okay? So the, they also have a uh, explanation from the score matching perspective. Essentially, every step you're trying to estimate in the score uh, basically is the gradient of your log Px. Px is the data density. It's the gradient respective data. It's a, uh, so, so if you know the score, then you can use in Langevin dynamic to recover the true data distribution. Okay. But here we're going to uh, focus on the on the diffusion model perspective. So in the diffusion model, as I mentioned, essentially what you do is uh, you're going to shrink your data a little bit, right? So you, one minus beta t is a coefficient, is smaller than one, you shrink your data a little bit and adding a little bit of Gaussian noise, okay? So you do this many, many times until you get to X capital T. And uh, this is a fixed encoder. So only thing that's that's changeable is the is the scheduling how you change beta t okay as t increases. But but if the beta t is fixed, essentially this is a fixed encoder. And what's special about this is a, is is a very nice property of a Gaussian distribution is that instead of go from x zero to x t one st step by step by adding a little bit of Gaussian noise at a time, you can actually go from X0, which is the true data, to XT, which is a noisy image in a single step. Okay, so you, this is a simple property of a Gaussian distribution. This linear Gaussian, this linear, linear Gaussian operation. And, and uh, you can directly shrink the data by particular coefficient and adding a bit, adding corresponding noise. Okay, 
So this is the encoder of the diffusion model. And then you, you define a decoder. What a decoder does is, uh, um, can you give me a noisy image? Can you also tell me the noise level, basically the T, and then can you tell me how to denoise it? Denoise it. So that's the decoder. And to train this encoder decoder, essentially you're going to using a evidence lower bound, uh, which is, uh, uh, we, we, so essentially you can also think about the diffusion model as a variational encoder. Uh, we is a, so in typical, in, in typical variational encoder, you have a single linear Gaussian layer, right? And the non-linearly come from the mapping from the, data, from the data to the parameter of the Gaussian. That's where non-linearly go, go to. And also coming from your, your, latent your, your latent representation to output, that's, that's non-linear, but the likelihood is still Gaussian, okay? But here is a multi-layer uh, stochastic encoder and a multi-layer stochastic decoder. And, uh, but, it's still, but essentially you can, visual, you can train as a variational encoder by, by, um, by calculating the negative log likelihood. And you can, you can show there's a way to manipulating uh, this ne negative evidence level bound into, into uh, T capital T, T plus one different term, okay? And uh, because your Q is Gaussian, your P is Gaussian, we know the KL between Gaussian and Gaussian is uh, analytic. So all this term can be, has analytical formulation, okay? So that's another nice thing about this diffusion model, okay? Okay, so I'm not going to go to the more technical detail, um, but uh, the, key, the key message I'm going to show here, as you can see, if you want to generate a single image, you need to go through this network. So you, theta is a network. You need to go through this network capital T number of times. So T typically, for example, is 1,000. Then you need to go through this network 1,000 at a time. So which makes it not scalable in, uh, in, in generation. It takes maybe 20 seconds to generating a single image, which is not realistic uh, for, for, re for real world deployment. I mean, real time deployment. Okay. So limiting its application to uh, various particular applications. Okay. So, so how, how, can we, how can we find a way to uh, make it, uh, how can we find a way to significantly accelerate this diffusion model, right? So our idea is actually uh, pretty simple. So in previous method, notice that you have, you, you, you decompose your evidence low bound into uh, T, into L0, and this T minus one different term and L capital T. So L capital T is typically ignored because you're assuming you diffuse your X zero to a pure Gaussian noise because your prize noise and the QXT also become noise. So this one can be ignored. So if you have a, a sufficiently small step or uh, high enough diffusion rate to make sure your XT become approximately normal distribution, standard normal distribution, then this term can be ignored, okay? But what if you, what if you make this T become smaller? You have, you have one choice. If you want to make your T smaller, but LT still can be approximately as zero, then you need to increase the diffusion rate. So what happens if you're increasing the diffusion rate? If you're increasing the diffusion rate, then your reverse can no longer be approximated by Gaussian distribution. And then your generation quality goes down, okay? So there, there is a dynamic. So you, you have to make T large such that the diffusion rate is small. So you, when your diffusion rate is small, your backward can be approximated as Gaussian. Okay, if your diffusion rate is not small, then your backward cannot be approx well approximated by a Gaussian distribution. Okay. Okay, so that's then we that that's when we have our idea proposed. We call it a truncated diffusion. So our idea is uh, is the following. So instead of instead of uh, asking the model to diffuse to denoise a little bit by a little bit. We, we ask this question. Since, since 
in, in the intermediate step, you have a noisy image. Is it possible for me to compress? For example, let's say you have 1,000 step. Is it possible for me to compress step 10 to step 1,000 into a single step? So I go from step 1,000 to step 10 in a single step. Is it possible to do that? And we show actually it's doable. And uh, mathematically we're talking about is uh, instead of ignore the last, last term, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to say, well, we're not going to, we're not going to diffuse to pure noise. We're going to diffuse to a distribution. Let's we just do 10 diffusion step. We have a distribution, okay, x0 to x10. But we don't know, we don't know, we don't know this KO term, okay? So we want to using a, a GAN to model it. So essentially we want to say, well, instead of assuming your starting point is a Gaussian distribution. So that's what you do in the diffusion model. You're starting from Gaussian distribution, do 1,000 steps, it goes to clean image. We're going to say, well, we don't want to 1,000 step. We only want 10 steps. So you want, but the, the tenth step cannot be Gaussian anymore. It has to be something more complicated. So that's why we say, well, let's make the tenth step to be implicit distribution. And this implicit distribution, then essentially we can model with again. And then we're going to modify the loss into, we're going to modify the loss to say, this is a GAN loss, but everything else is the same as, as a deficient model. Okay. So I ho hope it gets this clear. But, uh, but without thinking about the like, technical detail, just, just a take home message is uh, instead of doing a little bit of denoising by a little bit of denoising, I can directly go from noise to a noisy image in a single step. And another key, key, uh, key perspective here is uh, I don't need an additional network to do so. I can use the exact same network I'm using to do denoising and use that, re, reuse that network here, okay? So the same network knows in the first step, it is going to take a big step, go from pure noise to a noisy image. And then the remaining step is doing a little bit of denoising at a one, one step at a time, okay? So that, that's, the, that's the whole idea, okay? So why, why this is sensible? So why this is sensible, okay? So think about the problem of, again, I mentioned it before. It typically has a mode collapse, right? and it's unstable to train. But if you have a data uh, look like this, but if you add in noise, so, okay, maybe this is more clear. So this is the original data, right? So if I do the forward diffusion, go to here. So now this become very like a noise distribution. So modeling this one using a GAN may be difficult. But a modeling a noise version of it actually it become much easier. So even you have many disconnected mode in your data, after you diffuse the data, basically you shrink the data, any noise, and if the noise is strong enough, all the modes would get connected. So you don't you no longer have a multimodal distribution. It's more like it become unimodal distribution, and this is become much easier to to model using a generative model. So using using a generated model based on GAN, okay. And then uh, after you model this one, then you can use the usual diffusion model to denoise a little bit at a time to get it to your original data. Okay. So this is actually what we showed is uh, if you're using the, uh, our method, you're going to add in noise, add in noise, add in noise, and your first step is to model this distribution and comes back, okay? Let's look at this data, this may be more clear. So this is the original distribution, you're adding noise, adding noise, adding noise. This is a noise distribution. So you're going to use it again to generating this noise distribution and then using the same uh, network architecture to do noise one step at a time until you come back, okay? So, so in the previous method, you need a, to make you need a, to diffuse much longer to make this become pure Gaussian noise. That's when you can come back.
But if you don't diffuse long enough and come back, you won't be able to recover the original data distribution. Okay. okay, so let me take a look at the chat. I think maybe there are questions over there. So Adarin has a question. So what is the difference with the symmetric, symmetrized the KL, the fact that it gets rid of mutual singularity? So, okay. So symmetrize the KL, well, the question is uh, KL, if you don't have a analytical density function, you don't know how to compute it, right? So we actually, in the paper we show, th th this can be related to symmetrize the KL as long as you compute it. Okay, so, so if you can compute it, then you can use the symmetrize the KL to actually, uh, to, so this is, talking about this, this problem. So if you have a symmetrized KL, actually you can use the symmetrized KL to measure your mode cover and mode, mode seeking behavior. But if you don't have an analytical density function, you won't be able to compute KL. So that's the key thing. So in this work, what we show is all you need is a sample from your data distribution and your fake distribution. Then you can compute in this conditional transport. But for KL, you need a density function, which you don't know for deep journey model. Okay, because in deep journey model, typically is noise goes through a network, you don't have an analytical density function. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, thanks. So uh, thanks, Andrea. If you have any more questions, please feel free to leave the chat. Okay. Okay. So any, any question about the truncated diffusion part? So let me, let me recap. So in, in diffusion model, typically you have, let's say you have 1,000 step to do the forward diffusion. Every time you need, you're adding a little bit of Gaussian noise and at the time 1,000, it becomes pure Gaussian noise almost. And then you, in your decoder or your reverse diffusion, you're starting from pure Gaussian noise. You're going to, you're going to denoise a little bit at each step. And then after 1,000 step, you will cover the original image. In our truncated diffusion model, we're saying, well, this is not necessary. Many remaining steps, for, for example, from step 1000 to step 10, you can compress in a single step. So you can model this as an implicit distribution using the same network architecture. So the same network knows in the first step, what it's supposed to do is to generate a noisy image. And then in the remaining 10 steps, it's going to denoise that one at a time. Uh, denoise a little bit at, at each step. Okay. So that's the idea of truncated denoise and diffusion. And uh, this is on, on, on real image. This is showing, well, um, instead of doing 1000 step, I can do 99 step. So I first generate a noisy image and then denoise. Or even I can do in three steps, I can generate a noisy image and then denoise. And the, 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 the time saving is proportional to the number of steps. If you only have three steps, your computation is three over 1,000 of the original diffusion model with 1,000 steps. Okay. So that's the basic idea of truncated diffusion. So what do we learn from this model? So first of all, it's significantly faster, right? And there's no extra generating parameter and the diffusion model, and again, they help each other. Okay. Um, Okay, let me skip this. Okay. <clears throat> so then let's quickly talk about another work we did is called a diffusion GAN. So we, we have been asking ourselves why, why diffusion model works really well, right? It's because the evidence low bound, uh, this hierarchical structure or, 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 or what's the magic over there, right? So we have been trying to think about another perspective. We think about diffusion model essentially is type of data augmentation because it, it uh, shrink the data and adding noise. This, the shrinkage and the noise level, uh, are, are the many different combinations, right? You, you have seen every, you have seen many different noise level uh, in, the, in the data. So basically this is a way to augment your data, right? Adding noise is the way to augment the data. And if you, from this perspective, you can think about, can we, can we using this to, uh, can we use this to uh, just to, to train again? And the answer is yes. 
we can use this to train again by we can use this to train again to say basically you are going to have a forward diffusion on your original data and you can also have a forward diffusion on your fake data so the the diffusion is type of, you can think about the type of data augmentation. You shrink your data a little bit, adding a little bit of noise. And, uh, and then you have a discriminator would have been learn how to discriminate in the true data and the fake data. Okay. And the true data is a noise version of your observed data. The fake data is a noise version of the generated data. Okay. And uh, this providing theoretical benefit is that uh, the theoretical benefit of this is uh, you no longer have to worry about uh, the, the theoretical issue of the Jason Shannon divergence, which you have uh, not, you don't have a useful gradient when your generator distribution and the true data distribution have no overlapping support. Once you do the diffusion, you, do, you no longer have this issue, okay? If then, for example, if you're adding noise, you diffuse 200 step is not enough, they're still pretty separated, but it diffuse more, they will have sufficient overlap and you have then you're providing easy gradient for you to uh, drive your to the drive your generated distribution to your true data distribution okay so and we we show this one can be easily combined with the existing architecture uh, for example uh, for example the so let me see I have some issue with my for, for example, you can apply with this diffusion GAN, and uh, you can also combine with uh, projected GAN, and we basically show this simple idea needs to state of the art results on lower resolution image, but also not only on lower resolution benchmark, but also on a higher resolution, like a 1024 by 1024 face image and a 520 by 512 by, by 512 AFHQ data set. So let me show you some example results. And this is the example I showed you before on the Pokemon data set with only 83, 833 training image. You can generate um, images not in the Pokemon data set, but looks quite like Pokemon data set. And also this is an example of the uh, lesson bedroom data set. This is an example of um, lesson church data set. And uh, and this is the example results on the AFQ data set, and this is the results on, on the face image data set. So essentially we are able to achieve state of art results um, on, on all this data set, okay? By combining, combining the idea of diffusion with, with GAN, okay? So, so given the time, let me, let, me, let me summarize. So the first is uh, um, the GAN, and the diffusion model, they can help each other. Okay. Instead of doing a diffusion model, which needs a thousands of reverse diffusion step, you can significantly shorten the diffusion, reverse diffusion step by, by replacing the first, uh, let's say, 90% of the step with the, with the GAN, or even 99% with the GAN. Okay. And uh, another idea is uh, uh, GAN training can benefit from adaptive forward diffusion. Okay, so you're going to apply forward diffusion to both your true data and the generated data and uh, plug into the, GAN frame, into the GAN framework. And that leads to uh, a, a state of that results by essentially where you're diffusing as one type, one type of data augmentation. Okay. And the take home message is uh, com combining, exploiting adaptive diffusion can help significantly accelerate the generation speed of diffusion model but also maintaining high generation quality, okay. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy for any question you may have. Okay. Thanks, Minwan. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. So if you have any questions, so we have already one question in the Q&A box, okay. uh, John. Yeah, John asked a question, does the type of noise play any particular significance in the results um, or retrieve the data. So 
so I'm trying to, uh, so, so the, the, if it's a denoising diffusion model, uh, it's based on the Gaussian noise. The reason it's based on Gaussian noise is because in the forward diffusion step, you're adding Gaussian noise a little bit one step at a time, but you, you, can, you can marginalize out all the intermediate steps directly go from X0 to XT. I think this is one important perspective about the Gaussian noise, but also with Gaussian noise, the KO turn in your evidence lower bound can be computed analytically, okay? So I think it's possible to use other type of noise, but you won't have this, you, 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 will, lose, uh, you will lose lots of nice property of Gaussian noise, okay? For the diffusion model, for the diffusion GAN we did, uh, actually uh, we think uh, we are free to choose other type of noise, okay? You, you can potentially choose highway tail, for example, Laplace noise or student T noise. I think it's possible. We, we haven't tried that in, um, very carefully, but I think it's, it's a, there's no theoretical issue for us to do that. Okay. Does, does that answer your question, John? No, any other questions? Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Sandeep, I have a question. For the first implementation, where you're saying that you can shortcut the first step with a GAN generating each, and that did I understand that you said that it is the same network? That yes, thanks, Sandeep. Exactly. Let me let me go to go back to the uh, architecture. So, for for this step, we can using a GAN. So the the network here can be the exact same as the unit used in the denoise and diffusion step. So one, one important uh, part of the diffusion model is every step it has the unit. This unit, it's the same, but every time you tell it, you, you give it the T, the T is the time. Basically you think about it, net is a node, the, the noise node in, in the image. So in the first step, we can actually using the exact same unit, okay? But we also tried, you can use in different network architecture. Uh, the benefit is you actually can further improve the performance by using, for example, style gain architecture here. Uh, the, 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 the sacrifice is you're going to uh, increase, adding, adding more number of network parameters, okay? So uh, in our, results presented in the paper, all we show is using the same network. But we, in, in the appendix, we, I think we have some results showing if, what if you're using different architecture and we show we can actually further boost the performance. Okay, thanks. Let me see. Yeah, this is actually the slide summarize of that. Can we have a, an additional questions? in the chat from Wong Chao. Uh, Sandeep, I have another question. Would it be possible to have an adaptive time step like solving an ODE? That's a good question. Um, I, I'm not so sure. I, I need to think of this more. Um, I think it's, it's, this could be a very nice opportunity to think about this, this perspective. Yeah, so for the diffusion model, there's lots of work on, on from, the, from the differential uh, equation perspective to think about how to, um, how to solve it. Instead of using the discrete time, maybe using continuous time version, um, we have, we, the stuff we did here is all based on the discretized version. So we haven't thought about in that perspective. So I think that there are potential opportunity over there as well. Thanks. Can we one of you have an additional questions in the chat? Okay. Not in the Q&A box. Uh, in the Q&A box? In the chat box. Uh, so it is from Wang Chao. 
Could you please comment more on comparing the methods with the score-based gradient learning method? Oh, okay, oh yeah, I saw that. Okay. Uh, could you please comment more on comparing the method with the score-based gradient learning method in the speed? Yeah, so so the the score-based uh, gradient learning method. So that's an so so the, the denoising diffusion model, uh, you can have two ways to think about it. One is from the variational encoder perspective, and uh, you, you, ob you, you have your object function formulated as the following. And uh, another perspective is basically score matching perspective, right? So uh, that's basically you're estimating, uh, you're adding noise such that you can estimating uh, the, the, the gradient of your uh, log px. And uh, we haven't uh, we we haven't uh, sort of very carefully about uh, whether the stuff we are doing can be uh, visual from that perspective. Okay, but uh, but uh, if you are comparing to DDPN, I think essentially we are comparing to score based method. Okay, because DDPN essentially is uh, almost equivalent to uh, score based method. Essentially, it, 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 actually, when they do the implementation, they are not exactly following the negative elbow. They're following a weighted version of the negative elbow. The, ne the weighted version of the negative elbow is essentially almost the same as the score, score based method. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think, I think uh, so I want to clarify the so score based method they actually proposed before, before the DDPM paper. So uh, if you read the DDPM paper, you can, you, you can, you can see the, all the actual art knowledge, lots of model construction. Uh, you, you can see the image uh, of a score-based method because that's what have all been demonstrated to be successful. So lots of modeling choice, network architecture, uh, and also the related version. My, my feeling is that uh, they're actually trying to uh, draw inspiration from the success of a score-based method. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, so if not, we will stop there. So it is one past uh, six. So thanks a lot, Miguel, for uh, Thank you. the invitation and giving this talk. Uh, thanks a lot. So we will uh, put the video on YouTube. So if you are anyone who is interested in uh, reviewing uh, uh, this talk, could find it uh, on YouTube. So that's it. So thanks a lot, Mingwan, and we will uh, we start. I think some uh, webinar associated to La Place's Demon uh, after the summer holidays. Thank you all. Have a good summer. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.